Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for the AIAA Los Angeles Las Vegas section, uh, e-section meeting on Saturday, October 9th, 2021. Today, we have a very exciting topic and a very good speaker. Uh, please enjoy. It's a very exciting topic we have been trying to do uh, uh, cover for uh, quite some time. Okay, so before that, we have some logistics. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot to AIWA headquarters for providing this extensive Zoom platform. Apologize for the noise. Uh, yeah, bear with me. After introduction, I will turn off my audio. Okay, so thanks to the speaker, the recording will be posted after the event. And uh, if you have bandwidth issue with your Wi-Fi or internet, you can dial in, use the phone as the audio, and just use the internet for the uh, uh, video. Okay, so uh, please sign your, your real name so people can know who you are. And uh, uh, our event is actually networking event, so you are welcome to use the chat room uh, to interact uh, with uh, fellow attendees. And uh, uh, please gear your question more to the end in the Q and A session after the presentation. Uh, please click raise hand so you will be able to speak out and uh, uh, interact directly with the speaker. You're also welcome to type in the Q&A box. Uh, the speaker will try to address your question, but address your question, but mostly likely it will be in the Q&A session after the presentation, the slide presentation. Okay, a few words about AIWA. So AIWA is a very distinguished organization merged from two uh, famous organizations established in, uh, in 1920s, one by the Wright brothers, uh, the other one by Robert Gather, so one on aviation, one on rocketry. It's uh, a national organization. We are region six in the West Coast, uh, but it's also international. Uh, so uh, we have, you know, today our speakers from Brazil. We actually have quite some member in Brazil. They are doing uh, excellent jobs. And uh, right now our AWA headquarter, uh, headquarter is in Western Virginia. Our president is Mr. Basel Hassan. Uh, executive director is Mr. Daniel. Uh, Dunbacher. Uh, he formerly worked in NASA in the uh, administration uh, and also very uh, important project in NASA. And our section chair is Dr. Jeffrey Puchel. He's AIW fellow. Uh, he's a, a chief scientist in Raytheon. Uh, Raytheon recently just changed name to Raytheon RTX uh, and uh, the stock is doing very good, very well. Okay, so. Um, as AIW, as mentioned, is in Western Virginia with headquarters. We are the local chapter based in El Segundo. South Bay will have few words about this area. So you can see uh, it's 90 plus years of aerospace leadership and it will continue to be the leader in aerospace. And uh, we have over 30,000 members across many, many countries and companies. Uh, many company organizations are our corporate, mem uh, corporate members like uh, Blue Origin, SpaceX, etc. So uh, why join professional society? You, you can put down your resume, it's good for your career, and you're able to meet many experts uh, around the world. Uh, you, you, you don't regularly meet those people in other, other organizations or occasions. And uh, you keep yourself updated with uh, insider story or trends, uh, just many things. And AIW also publish, that's very important. And uh, there are different level of membership, uh, the young professional member should, is actually a professional member in the early career, so they should have been called early career professional. They are not students, they are from university, just under 35 years old, and we're running 50% off for the member uh, should be for the early career professionals. We also have the new high school student and it's growing very fast. And uh, uh, online, you can see those resources, and more information, you just click aaa.org slash membership. And uh, once you join the membership, you can start to use AIWA Engage. It's a platform you can post uh, your information, chat, and uh, uh, try to connect to the people you want to connect to. And uh, it's a, 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 a join different groups. And also daily launch give you insider stories. Some people got opportunity jobs just by reading those things. And monthly, very distinguished Aerospace America cover a lot of great stories, aerospace, very exciting. And uh, other member enjoy great discount for uh, attending a major 
national forums, they save a lot of money. And uh, they had a way published and through ARC, <clears throat> the AIWA Foundation just got a million donation from Blue Origin. Uh, it's more for, mostly for education awards and the in, industry guide and, and of course engage. <clears throat> also great careers is for everyone, not just for students. Uh, it, the, one of the main good feature of AIWA is the career development. And also AIWA, the myth is that you can advance your ranks among uh, uh, AIWA. You start with member, senior member, you can advance uh, associate fellow if you're interested. Uh, for example, Mr. Elon Musk, uh, Mr. George of SpaceX, Mr. George White Size of, of uh, Virgin Galactic, as uh, they, are, they are our associate fellow. And uh, of course, you know, our former section chair, Robert Frank and our speaker last week, uh, Dr. Dietmar, they're also associate fellow. Our section chair, Dr. Jeff Bruchel, former section chair, Dr. James Wurz, uh, et cetera, and uh, uh, the president of Aerospace Corporation, Mr. Isakovich. Uh, they are all at our fellow. Another fellow, we have Dr. Bill Gerstenmeier, now is consultant in SpaceX. So you also have awards, Guggenheim awards, read a award for different contribution, leadership, publication, those things. We're very uh, 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 distinguished. And also student membership, you can, uh, with student members, you can apply for a scholarship and you can uh, join the design, build and fly contest, annual regional student paper conferences and essay rocket contest. This require student membership. And uh, <clears throat> we have an event coming up, it's called Ascend in Las Vegas. Uh, it's kind of to continue the formerly uh, flagship space conference. Uh, it's very exciting, it includes the commercial space as well. And uh, routinely, head of way national office also have the uh, webinar. Uh, so, and uh, courses, they issue certificate for uh, those courses as well. And uh, LA have five major forums every year. Uh, so uh, the defense just, uh, you know, uh, in September and a thing coming up, SciTech in January. So a few words for the local area. Uh, we mentioned this also to give you know, people uh, a little bit of time to sign in. Uh, this is Saturday. So Southern California is blessed with so many aerospace activities and the companies. We have Northrop Grumman, James Webb to be launched in December, JPL, NASA, and uh, we have a company building Super Hornet, Growler, and um, Aerospace Corporation, Space Debris, Space Tourism, Virgin Galactic, Virgin Orbit, SpaceX, and the student branches. Then we have new company, Launcher Space, Relativity space, more 3D, and uh, the Ampere for electric, electric hybrid. There are so many of this, and of course, great, uh, you know, good company, but uh, Ampere has been doing great jobs. We have also Honeywell, uh, ARJ Rakidine, Boeing, just so many. I mean, there's even more uh, medium, medium sized, small, small business as well. And we keep doing events to keep everybody engaged. It's all networking events. So after today, uh, to Tuesday will be planetary defense collaboration between um, among global uh, space agencies. And then we have the famous uh, co discoverer of the Shoemaker Levy 9 uh, that comet uh, impacted to Jupiter in 1993. Uh, this is a very big, uh, big, big event. Then we also have happy hour. Then we encourage uh, you know, people to participate. So we have a middle school student, Max, he designed the meeting online meeting room. Uh, he designed the virtual Starship Enterprise. So please join us and have fun. And the space debris is very uh, important. It just declares stress uh, for the, our national space or international space. So October 30th, we have a JPL uh, scientist, engineer, a head of a fellow to talk about space debris. And uh, we have a famous um, person is the son of the, uh, Francis Gary Powers, the famous person who was shut down in the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And his son is going to talk about more story about it, but that's, that's going to be in Las Vegas. We, uh, we also have newsletter. As you can see, we are designing our format. So please uh, join us and uh, it's, it's like a community. So share your articles, story, photos, and uh, to have fun and people know each other and learn more. Okay, so we post our video, if permitted, on YouTube and our website, and also we have podcasts. So today we are really so happy, you know, it's our great pleasure to have Mr. 
Renan Richter uh, uh, from Brazil. He's a Brazilian P3 C Orion pilot and an electric warfare uh, researcher. He's right now doing a PhD, PhD uh, in material science and microwave photonics research group in ITA. He will tell you more about it. And uh, I mean, ITA, uh, and uh, it's a very good um, uh, institute. And uh, he has served eight years in patrol squads. During, his period, period, uh, during this period, he held position related to electronic warfare systems and tactics. He holds a bachelor degrees in aeronautical science Sciences from Brazilian Air Force Academy, AFA, uh, the graduate degree in analysis of electromagnetic environment and the master of science degree in space sciences and technologies, both from uh, Aeronautics Institute of Technology, ITA. Currently, he is a PhD candidate in material science and uh, integrates the microwave photonics research group at ITA, focused on novel process directed for electronic warfare. So without further ado, let's welcome uh, Mr. Renan Richter. Okay, thank you so much, Ken. Let's share my screen. <laughs> so, hi, everyone. My name is Ken Hishid, like can introduce me. I'm a Brazilian Air Force pilot and science research from Aeronautics Institute of Technology. Today, I will present my first webinar with the AIWA with an extremely hype and exciting topic, which has very interesting points entitled From Geometry Concerns to radar absorbing materials inside the electronic warfare, improving aircraft tactics and survivability by radar cross section management. I hope you, you enjoy. So, to accomplish our mission, we will go through the following topics. The first one the need for survivability. The second one, stealth technology and the Gulf War. The third one, the RCS, radio cross section business principles. After that, an, uh, a little case of study based on one paper that direct to improving survivability, managing RCS. And finally, we will discuss radar absorbing materials and future trends. So the need for survivability. During and after the Vietnam conflict, DOD, Department of Defense, air components absorbed lessons learned in that conflict and were developing new systems and tactics, doctrine and operational concepts to cope with the rapidly improving Warsaw Pact conventional weapons capability led by Soviet Union. The United States and the North Atlantic Threat Organization, NATO, were preparing for major battles in two areas, Central Europe and the North Atlantic and Norwegian Sea Ocean Basins. In the former, the packed tactical air force posed a major threat to NATO ground force, aircraft and air bases. In addition, the pact led by Soviet development of the new air defense systems was prepared to pose a major threat to NATO air force should NATO counterattack Warsaw Pact ground force and air base. The United States and NATO developed capability to penetrate the pact defense by flying at low altitude, 100 to 200 feet, while employing electronic countermeasure and lethal defense suppression. In order to achieve acceptable levels of survivability, the radio of support aircraft to attack and close air support aircraft was high in some regions.
So the low altitude operations impeded the ability to locate targets Thursday. the United States Air Force adopted the pop-up and rolling maneuver performed as the target was approached. Still to, still to survive, the final approach to the target was limited from 10 to 20 seconds, which was marginal enough time for effective target acquisition and attack. It became very obvious from the heavy air asset losses when attacking heavily different targets in Vietnam and from the difficulties faced in Central Europe planning that a better way had to be found. Robert Ebal, distinguished professor emeritus at the Naval Postgraduate School at Monterey, California, is a survivability expert by many who are involved in the field of designing aircraft systems that are expected to survive in combat environments. He has authored several books on the subject and anyone interested in this field of science and design is encouraged to seek them out and read further on this subject. His books delve into the mission of survivability and provide information on the following. The aircraft survivability discipline, the anatomy of aircraft, missions and threats, and on the constituents, elements of survivability, susceptibility, and vulnerability. Both Ball defines survivability as the capability of an aircraft to avoid or withstand a man-made hostile environment. Ball defines susceptibility as the inability of an aircraft to avoid against approaching missiles, exploding warhead, air interceptors, radars, and all of those elements of an enemy's air defense, and vulnerability as the inability of an aircraft to withstand the main made hostile environment. Notice the fine distinction between the two. Susceptibility is framed in terms of what constitutes the hostile environment, while vulnerability is the ability to withstand those elements. Not to be susceptible is to avoid detection and interception through aircraft design and by characteristics that mitigate susceptibility, such as smokeless engines, low radar and infrared signatures, capable self-defense ordnance and speed and through the application of evasive tactics. Vulnerability as distant from susceptibility is mainly in the hands of the aircraft design and of the structure as assessment analyzed used to determine, to determine how well an aircraft can resist damage in a hostile environment and keep in line through to successful mission accomplishment. The aircraft designer knows that resistance to enemy threats can be built into the system up to a point. Modern aircraft by nature are fragile, tough enough to handle light conditions of high speed and high G forces, but at the same time to thin skin to survive proximate lethal warhead effects. In some ways, design efforts to make them less susceptible to enemy effort to destroy them, make them more vulnerable if hit. Susceptibility relies on speed, stealth, and tactics. The best way to avoid problems is to de develop mission profiles that avoid most threats. However, this is not always possible as the many other matter to avoid aircraft damage or loss. It is important that methods to reduce aircraft vulnerability continue to be considered by the Air Force and its airframe contractors. So this is a very interesting slide that portrays how the aircraft combat survivability discipline has behaved through the ages. As we can see from ferry battle to Kosovo war is an interval of 60 years, the loss rate has decreased dramatically. 
which denotes that combat survivability is one of the strongest pillars for the development of combat platforms in the current scenario. So as we can see, the ferry battle in 1940, we have a loss rate about 50%. In the Kosovo War, we have a 0.01 loss rate per 1,000 sort. It dramatically reduces. So the stealth technology and the Gulf War, we have similarities to points. The success of US military force in the Gulf War focused the world's attention on how technology could affect the outcome of war. Of all of the technology displays, the F-117 ended up on center stage. More than anything else, its effectiveness was based on the application of stealth technologies. This technology has become a pervasive part of America's culture and as such has embedded its elfin to the fabric of the American military machine. A new era was discovered thanks to the work developed by Skunk Works, a secret division of Lockheed Martin headed by the brilliant Kelly Johnson. There are several books that tell the story of Skunk Works and I really recommend reading them. They are undoubtedly stories of overcoming difficulties and faith in the face of the adversity that show how much we must persist in our convictions if we work hard. So let's talk about the RCS basic principles. Let's turn now to the RCS basic principles, but first I would like to draw your attention to this diagram that denotes what we need to study the stealth discipline directed at radio. As we can see, it is an intersection among signature engineering, military science, aeronautical engineering, and finally, radar engineering. There is no hierarchy between these disciplines. They complement each other at all times. So following the RCS basic principle, there are two aspects that I could, two points a rectangular mirror and a shiny sphere. Think about uh, first on a rectangular mirror. When you see your reflection, this means photons are leaving your face, bouncing off the mirror and then hitting your eyes. You are seeing photons that came from your own face. This will only happen if your face is located in a volume of space that is perpendicular to the mirror surface. If the mirror is at an angle to you, then you will not see your face. You will sit up in some other direction of the room. Now, let's think about a shiny sphere, like a Christmas ornament. You can always see your face right in the middle, no matter where you are in a good position to the ornament. That's because the middle of the sphere surface, as you see it, will always be perpendicular to the line between you and the center of the sphere. A shiny sphere will always reflect some of your face photon straight back to you. So this is the most important concept for understanding the other plane design. Let's pay attention. In order for you to see your reflection on a flat, shiny thing like a small mirror, for example, in order for photons to leave your face and bounce off the mirror and go back towards your face, your line of sight must be perpendicular to the mirror surface. This only happens inside a narrow region. Shine light from any other angle, other than perpendicular to the mirror surface, and we, it will bounce away from you. In order for you to see your reflection on a curved shiny thing like a Christmas ornament, for example, 
in order for photons to leave your face and bounce off your ornament and go back towards to you, your line of sight must be perpendicular to any point on the ornament surface. This happens from many angles, pretty much from anywhere in the room, because the ornament is curved. as with the shiny sphere versus the rect rectangular mirror. The regions from which you can shoot photons towards a round thing and have them comes back to you is anywhere. The regions from which you can shoot photons towards a shiny flat thing and have them come back towards you is only if you write top on top of it or right below it. Any other photons, for instance, from the side will bounce off and not go back the way you can. So the red zone in the diagram represents the region around the object where someone could fire off some photons at the object and the photons would bounce off the object straight back to the source. For example, the object would be detected. So we have two figures that point that aspect, uh, 787 with a cylindrical parts and a B2 with a face design. Now, in a more mathematical way, the radar cross-section can be defined as the relationship between the scattered field and the incident field. Note that the RCS concept is related to portions of energy from the electric field. This point demystifies that common sense that brings proportionality between object size and RCS. Small objects could have great RCS, and big objects could have low RCS. So this is a figure that summarizes all the factors that affect the RCS of an object. We have here a monostatic radar and a bistatic radar. So the frequency of the emission, the polarization, the target, size, shape, material, orientation, all, that, all those that influence on the RCS. And we have measures on the far field, almost for radars, and the near field for missile radars, for example. On a, on a complex target such, such as an aircraft, there is a wide variety of phenomena relating to the propagation of electromagnetic waves. They are especially related to the reflection and diffraction of waves. So in these aircraft, on a F-16, we have a many kinds of phenomena with curvature, discontinuity return, backscatter for a creeping wave, tip diffraction at aircraft nose, return from engine cavity, tip diffraction from fuel tank, edge diffraction, specular surface reflection, gap seen or discontinuity echo, diffraction at the corner and the multiple reflection. So the red box are related to reflection and the green box are related to, to diffraction. So there are many kinds of phenomena that influence on RCS of a target. So 
So how can we measure? We have this diagram that relate all the words related to the RCS measurement. So we have a real world problem. We have the experimentation, operational validity. It must a computer model, a code verification, a conceptual model, a conceptual validity, and an analytical modeling. So we return to a real world problem. All these, these spheres are pervasive of data analysis. And following with the measurement, we can measure on an anechoic chamber. We have a reception and transmission radar inside there, connected to a vector network analyzer in a computer. We have medium parameters, Maxwell equation, boundary conditions. We built an analytical model. Combined with user data computer program, we have numerical result. But sometimes it's expensive and hard to do this type of measurements. And we have a greater problem, the static RCS versus the dynamic RCS. So in a more formal way, we have many methods to analyze the object, the FDTD, the, tel, the TLM, the FEM, the method of moments and the SLPE. We have a numerical model, a light chip boundary simulators, a computer program in an X structure. We have numerical results, but it's not an exhaustive list. And we have the more indicated solvers to relate electrical size and complexity. So we will now present a case of study to evaluate the management of R RCS against a radar detection to gain sensing distance ad advantage. The aircraft analyzer is the A4 Skyhawk against an L-band radar. This is a, a paper that are entitled A4 Skyhawk Aircraft Depth Capacity against L-band radar based on dynamic target detection. It was published in IEEE Radar Conference 2020. So the altitude towards, towards the radar are defined of 500 feet, 5,000 feet, 12,000 feet. The theoretical maximum radar range is 32 nautical miles. The figure depicts the, the, the dynamic. So the first step is the stat modeling. The software model the A4 aircraft CAD in the real size dimension, which corresponds to a length of 12 meters, wingspan of eight meters and height of four meters. Another software performs the simulation using the ray launching geometrical opticals method Recommended for electromagnetic simulation in electrically large materials. The software performs the aircraft measurement in value of the lambda divided by four throughout the surface, generating triangular extractor with an average parameter of 12 centimeters. The modeling considers the angles theta of zero degree in front of the aircraft to 60 degrees with one degree of resolution, totalizing 61 values for the frontal aspect approach in this case. The aircraft follows a particular trajectory in order to fulfill a set of missions and based on the data obtained from the RCS simulation as functions of theta. 
it was evidenced if the A4 employs a flight path in the direction of the gradient, it may benefit from the characters of low RCS when performing an incursion in an L-band radar site. The dynamic modeling was made by a MATLAB script, including all the static model data. So just to review, we have the static modeling. We have a CAD of the A4. Following the dynamic modeling, we have a MATLAB script with the radar parameters and the probability density function, plus the math mathematical interpolation from 100 feet until 20,000 feet, and we, ha we have this graph. So the conclusions about the case of three. The theoretical radar range was reduced from 32.2.3 nautical miles to 12.15 nautical miles under the study flight path. Furthermore, after the interpolation from zero to 20,000 feet, the dynamic RCS study revealed that 10.4 thousand feet was the A4 best option, detected only 6.05 nautical miles far from radar. The research proved that tactics and RCS are very close interrelated, and even the A4 doesn't belong to a stealth fighter generation it achieved good results against uh, LBM radar. So let's talk about now radar absorbing materials and future trends. Radar absorbing materials is most effective against shorter wavelength radar, such as on radar guided missiles and almost fire. It is less effective against longer wavelengths, such as from ground-based radar. While early, while early stealth airplane made copious use of RAM, modern ones rely almost solely on their shape and use small amounts of RAM in a small number of critical spots, such as corners, openings gaps. Many radar absorber material substances are thus toxic, making airplane maintenance difficult. So following on the RAM, atoms absorb electromagnetic radiation when the energy of each photon, which depends on the frequency of the radiation, electrical permittivity, and magnetical permeability, is the main parameter that defines the capacity of a material to store energy. It turns out that the iron absorbs electromagnetic radiation relatively well for the frequencies on most radars. Specifically, the oscillating magnetic field pushes on the particles and causes much of the energy to be turned to heat, rather than into photons that bounce back out. Carbonyl iron and ferrite are available in very small spherical particles that look like ray foundry, known as iron balls. These have been applied to stealth airplanes by being banded in new print tiles or suspended in paint, in paint or glue. These tiles, paint, do not make the airplane visible to all radios or even to radios of any given wavelength. Fighter radios tend to use relatively short wavelengths. Ground-based radio tends to use longer wavelengths. 